in search where we're working has some unique constraints because we generally have a very high volume of queries and very strict latency requirements, uh, like real time. A lot of machine learning is run in batches, like once an hour or so. But when you have to return things in real time with very large numbers of queries, uh, things get a little bit more interesting. Uh, so I guess I'll we'll give a little background about, background about what Mercari is and uh, the situation we were in when we introduced our machine learning model. So Mercari is uh, Japan's largest consumer-to-consumer -consumer online marketplace, like an online free market, flea market. Uh, our vision is a circular economy, so sustainability. We want to reduce the number of things that go to landfill, reduce the number of new things we have to manufacture by having allowing people to resell their things instead of uh, putting throwing them away. Um, our net sales are about 150 billion yen, a little over a billion dollars US. And uh, within search, we have over 20 million monthly active users, so unique visitors to our website every month, uh, hundreds of millions of active listings in our catalog, and thousands of queries per second. And our all-time peak is over 10,000 queries per second. So that's kind of the uh, this, the landscape we saw when we had our first machine learning model that we wanted to put into production. Uh, our initial uh, original uh, architecture was a traditional term-based architecture based on Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is an industry-wide standard, very widely used, but it's term-based. That means that the keywords that you enter in the query are what are returned. Uh, so if, if somebody had not written that exact keyword in their description of their item, you wouldn't find it. Uh, so that was a big limitation of Elasticsearch, although it was still working very well for us for 10 years. Uh, but uh, our challenge was then to take this traditional architecture and add machine learning into it. And so now I'll uh, pass the mic over to Tio. Thanks, Ryan. And so as Ryan mentioned, my name is Tio. I'm going to be discussing the next part of our talk, which is the problem. So. Um, as Ryan mentioned, we have this existing search architecture, but why do we need AI in this system, right? And so while this was very effective, this was Mercari's search backbone for over 10 years, there were a few major shortcomings. So Elasticsearch is a keyword-based system, and because of that, it kind of falls for things like this, right? So these are areas where AI can help. For instance, um, ambiguous keywords, um, semantics, saying cool toys for boys, and personalization. And so with keyword-based matching, um, you can't resolve any of these issues. So again, going back to ambiguous keywords, in Japan, One Piece is a type of women's clothing, um, but it's also the name of a very popular Japanese manga franchise. And so if you're just using queries, matching you know, the query to relevant items, um, which gets returned? Maybe both, right? Um, when you only wanted one or the other, very different items. And then semantics. Again, cool toys for boys. Maybe this one piece bag is a cool toy for boys, but that's not in the title or the description, so it will never come up. And then personalization. Um, again, there's no real easy way to personalize results to a user just based on a query itself. These are all ways that we knew AI-based methods could help improve the search that we had at Mercari. And so the question is, where do we start, right? So we have an idea. Let's, let's do AI in search at Mercari but how do we do it in a world that wasn't designed for it? So the search architecture was designed originally without AI in mind at all, right? So there were no easy ways for us to integrate AI. And because uh, Mercari is, again, Japan's largest consumer marketplace, at the scale that we had, we had very strict performance requirements. And so our latency budget was, in our case, just tens of milliseconds, which is it's really, really tough for machine learning models. Um, and we also didn't have access to, again, no easy hooks for AI. Um, optimal ways of um, serving these AI requests, right? That's not really built into the search architecture. And so the final thing that we want to discuss is these are kind of like infrastructural constraints, but the main constraint we had was user search experience at all costs. So no matter what we do, the user search experience must be as good or if not better um, at each step of the way. And so we always want the situation on the right and not the left, right? That's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, by using AI to improve search results, right? And so this was the hardest part of the, I guess, the constraint, but I think it was the one that served us very well to deliver the actual business impact of our system as opposed to just, say, model performance or something like this. 
And so, um, what is the first way that we decided to apply AI in search, right, with an existing search infrastructure that didn't have AI? So, enter search re-ranking. This was the original place that we felt AI would add the most value, highest ROI, with the simplest, least intrusive integration into our existing system. And so, um, our colleagues, Alex and Norbert, actually got into the ML side of this talk um, on, I think, Thursday morning, uh, the second talk of the day. And so there's uh, two aspects when you consider adding an ML system into an existing search architecture, where the elastic search result, the original result that came back, can be considered the first phase of retrieval. And now we're adding a second phase where we can re-rank those results on top. And so essentially the goal is, you know, we have this set of results. Can we surface the most uh, relevant ones to our users first, which is even more powerful in uh, e-commerce context, right? So when, say for instance, if you're on Google doing a Google search, maybe you're, you have a little more patience to go to the next page, the third page for search results. But for an e-commerce platform, it's very crucial to have the most relevant results first. In the long term, which is ultimately serves our broader purpose of matching users to the items um, which they're looking for. And so with uh, the first concrete use case for AI in search in mind, we go to the next step, which is the evolution of this ML system, right? So how do we grow an ML system while again running the business, ensuring a really high user search experience? And I want to emphasize that the focus is always on least risk, very iterative development on the highest ROI areas. Um, that we see in each iteration and then going from there. And so, um, given our existing infrastructure, the first thing that we did was the simplest solution, which is if we do have a machine learning model, we can integrate it directly within the search server. And so, um, this had a lot of benefits, um, but there were a few drawbacks. For instance, um, we tightly coupled model development with development of the search service itself. The code base is massive. We have many developers working on it concurrently. Um, as you would imagine, such a key part of the Mercari platform, it is, has a very high release cadence, and so we had to be very careful um, when we were developing. Uh, along the way, this whole journey was very measured. We wanted to make sure that you know, we, didn't have, we weren't able to provide major features out of the gate, but we also um, preempted any major incidents, right? So in production, we were running um, you know, very reliably the whole time. So because of that, um, we made it very difficult. We went very, very slowly at this stage, but we went, right? This was a step in the right direction. And um, I do want to mention that because in keeping with the theme of this talk of open source, for each of these stages of um, system evolution, we wanted to just include one of the many libraries just to highlight um, that kind of brought us um, from that stage to the next stage. And so in this case, um, our search server is actually written 100% in Go. And so we're very limited in the libraries that we could use, but we did find a very useful one. This is called Leaves. And so in this case, we just developed an internal component that used this library to serve a light GBM model um, directly in the Go code in the search server. And so it was uh, very simple to implement, as mentioned. Um, it was just a function call right to this component which served this model. Um, with that being said, again, there were problems with this solution that we addressed in the next phase of the system. And so um, in this case, it was characterized by really us um, going all in on our microservices architecture. So Mercari is very, very heavily invested in microservices, um, very Kubernetes first um, company. And so it was very easy, a very natural choice for us to now split the ML model from the search server to a custom Python microservice for model serving, which was again, very simple but um, actually unlock huge benefits. Now we could develop independently from the rest of the search team from that huge search code base. And um, again, originally it was just a function call to the model in the existing kind of search server. Now we just easily replace that function call with an RPC. And now since it's going over the network, we have a small timeout. And now we introduce the notion of a baseline response, which in this case is elastic search rankings. And so um, what's very useful in deploying ML productions or ML systems to production is having some kind of really simple baseline that you can um, iterate on top of. And because we already have Elasticsearch results, this was the natural choice for us and went back to our do no harm to users kind of tenant, right? So um, by definition, uh, this, if this re-ranking system was implemented, in the worst case, it would do no worse than what was already in place currently. 
So again, this key aspect of having this baseline response helped us to really iterate quickly um, in this stage and the next stage. And we also took the time to, as we're building out our POCs, um, to implement basic um, production kind of, um, in this case, metrics, but production features that help us in the future. So in this case, we add uh, more observability to our system, but we're constantly um, paving the path to a more production system in the future, right, along the way with each iteration. Now, that wasn't strictly necessary, but we knew it was a good thing to do at the time and very natural. And wanted to emphasize that at these key points is when we add the complexity, because now we realize there's an actual need, right? Um, and so, in keeping with uh, the OSS talk, and because we moved to a Python microservice, this gave us a lot more flexibility. And so, using re-ranking, we went with TensorFlow re-ranking. Uh, TensorFlow, um, for those of you here who aren't familiar, is an open source library uh, made by Google. Um, it's been open source for many years now, uh, industry standard um, in a lot of ways. Um, high performance, it's been validated, has um, very active development. So again, a natural choice for us going forward and really kind of helped us to um, really get through this next stage um, successfully. And so um, with this being said, the system was still very basic and there are still many ways for us to improve on the system. And so this is the next solution that we settled on. And so as mentioned previously, um, the search server um, with the model baked in, uh, features were computed within the search request. And so we realized a lot of those features were, well, the computation of the features was very redundant. And so if now we have, um, say, consider a feature store like a distributed cache for inputs for a model, and what we iterated on, which is kind of not present in the slide, I'll go over it really quickly, was again, very basic next steps. And so instead of computing features within a search request um, every time, now we can pre-compute them. Um, in this case, we used um, a big table, which is cloud managed um, on disk storage um, by Google. Um, that was a lot better, uh, but it did not meet our current latency requirements at the time, um, reliably, I should say. And so we then upgraded from that to using Redis, which is an in-memory key value store. And it served the same purpose. We were able to keep the interface the exact same. And then that was the key to further improving the system's performance to meet the aggressive latency requirements that we mentioned earlier. And um, in addition, as mentioned before, we have timeouts on the re-ranking request. We also have timeouts and fail safes on this feature store component. So um, we can get into it a little later. There's a few details in there, but essentially with each um, abstraction that we added and each layer of complexity, there was always a safeguard to fall back to that previous um, more simple layer that we had before. And again, um, further improving our monitoring um, kind of observability suite along the way, realizing kind of what metrics we needed to track both operationally and for model performance. Um, and it's worth emphasizing here that a major bottleneck that we now had is again, I mentioned, oh, we're developing very quickly, right? Um, that meant that uh, we had to do a lot of A-B tests, which is essentially, you know, we have something that's in production, we run something that receives a certain part of traffic, this new feature, and we see, oh, does this feature um, raise any of these key metrics that we have that are related to the business? And because we were able to develop quickly, we were able to develop and test new features quickly. But now the bottleneck wasn't necessarily feature development, but it was actually the A-B tests themselves. So we could develop features very quickly, but each new A-B test required um, a new model, which needed essentially to be deployed as a new microservice and set up the same way as we set up the original model, which you multiply by the amount of models in any given A-B test. So that was actually taking us about maybe a full engineer's time per quarter. And even with that, it would be one to two A-B tests maximum. And so that became the next bottleneck in this phase of our system evolution. Um, and before I get on, go on to the next um, phase, I do want to highlight the next open source library that we use that was um, very high value. Again, feature store we settled on Redis as the actual backing technology. And so very simple, uh, it's just a Go Redis, which is the Redis client for the Go language. Um, nothing really special to say, which I guess is kind of the main um, point, right? The main emphasis was it just integrated out of the box really easily with our, um, our current cloud managed Redis um, uh, instance, and it had really great performance. And so, um, Again, open source along the way. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel on this one either. And then um, finishing up with the systems evolution, this is the final 
um, iteration currently. We have many more in the future, but this is where we're at right now, um, which is adding Selden Core for serving and Istio for model routing. And these together will alleviate that bottleneck that we mentioned previously. So instead of having to set up new microservices and Kubernetes configurations for each model that we're A-B testing and then tear them back down again, um, we can move all that manual work and automate that. So the feature flags we mentioned earlier, those can get sent directly as is without us modifying any code. And then Selden can actually just, with Istio's help, route those to the correct endpoints. And we can just spin up and down A-B tests, um, hopefully, uh, an order of magnitude faster. And so again, iterative development, this I think will allow us to iterate even uh, more quickly and really help us to now not just develop the features, but A-B test them and now release them to really improve that user search experience a lot more. And in conclusion, we believe that ML enhanced search really is worth the effort. So if you have a traditional search architecture, um, ML can really add a lot to that. And um, I can't really get into exact numbers to show how worth the investment it is. But as Ryan mentioned earlier, um, our annual net sales are on the order of a billion dollars. So even just a 1% improvement in that direction is pretty significant, right? And so again, um, this went back to our very iterative approach to this system. So 1% decrease would also be um, horrible, right? Um, but at the same time, because of, we went iteratively along the way, we were able to prove our system out, release it to production, and um, have positive lifts. So it definitely was well worth the investment in our case. And we would consider, um, we'll urge everyone here to consider a top-down integration of AI, right? So um, while it would have been possible to totally rewrite this architecture and re-implement it from scratch, that would have been really dangerous. And I can't feasibly think of a way to do that that wouldn't have negatively affected our users. Um, but with a top-down system, we can slowly integrate into search. And now, um, over time, you have an AI-based search system that is essentially as if you had written it from scratch anyway. Um, and again, in doing this top-down integration, this iterative development, you can really balance that engineering business trade-off, um, which if you go in this way, we think maybe um, very rapid iterations, you can start with the simplest, highest RRI features first, and at each step, just kind of laid that minimum amount of groundwork necessary for the main stage. So don't over-engineer your systems, but at least a little bit, make it extensible so you can evolve to that next, you know, uh, overcome that next bottleneck that presents itself. And then I wanted to finish off um, with this quote that I really like personally. It's from the great John Maxwell, which is, uh, one is too small a number to achieve greatness. And I mention that because um, at Mercari, one of our values is an all for one um, literally, it's all for one. It means just teamwork, um, everyone helping each other. So uh, a system at this scale would not have been possible without the help of um, many, many teams across the organization. So I wanted to say thank you to them. And to give back in keeping with that spirit, we're also building the system to serve search in general. So it started with our smaller team that was in search. Now a lot more search engineers can be empowered to um, add machine learning to the overall search system at Mercari. And um, once that's in place, we are aiming for a, an organizational wide platform so that really AI can permeate uh, much more easily across the org and reach its way to our, all of our users. And so, um, again, in all for one, one is too small a number to achieve greatness. Um, we wanted to thank the open source community. So um, as we wanted to emphasize along the way, this wouldn't have been possible without open source, right? Um, Mercari, search ML at Mercari would not have been possible, at least um, at this speed, at this, with this quality, without the open source software that we use. It's almost entirely built on open source libraries. And um, in keeping with that, we at Mercari also open source our internal tools and resources back to the community when possible. Um, in addition to, as engineers, um, you know, contributing PRs and bug fixes to the libraries we use. Because you know, Mercari was founded on the premise of a, a, a circular economy, um, where everyone can buy and sell. We also believe in a circular development economy where anyone can contribute and hopefully anyone can build these you know, scalable ML systems without you know, having to be at the scale of Mercari. And so we wanted to give back to that um, and really kind of pay it forward. So we believe open source was the key differentiator in our case. And we really hope that the information in this presentation was valuable to the open source community present here today. Um, thank you for listening, and we are excited to answer any questions that everybody may have. Thank you.
Rick, so some questions for Rick and Theo. Uh, thanks, thanks for the sharing. So uh, I just have one question about uh, the search method that you are uh, implementing. Um, do correct me if I'm wrong, but you're actually um, using the ML models to re-rank the results based on your original results. Um, yes. So does it mean that it will, in most cases, be slower than your original method without the ML models in actual product? Yeah, exactly, 100%. And uh, sorry, what was your name one more time? Sorry? Uh, so what was your name? Uh, Billy. So, sorry, one more time? Yes. Billy. Billy. Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. So that was a great question. The short answer is yes. And that's what led to our strict latency requirements earlier, is that we kind of um, did the bookkeeping and said, this is the only permissible amount of latency that can be added to the existing system, right? The current um, latency metrics that the system without AI was um, performing at. Thanks. I'll just add to that. We did some experiments uh, to determine how much uh, extra latency a user would tolerate. And uh, we found it was pretty pretty low, but uh, not zero. So that was our, our opportunity to add in re-ranking on top of the existing system. Uh, would you mind sharing uh, what are the common metrics you look at when you perform the A-B testing for your new model? That is a good question. In general, we could say our uh, business metrics were sales. So uh, the more we sold, the better that our product people were happy. Yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, yeah I guess that uh, testing or that validation, you only get once you put it into production, right? So perhaps uh, to your question, is how do you test that in advance to know that you're not going to miss the mark once you once you roll the model out? Yeah. Okay. So just pass it back first. Hi. Uh, would you be able to share a little bit on the SRE side and all the uh, performance, uh, you know, um, redundancies that you have to put in place? Sure, um, we'd love to. Is there a specific area that you're considering? Um, uh, yeah, like uh, I guess that you probably have, you know, multiple um, uh, Elasticsearch uh, instances. You know, you will have multiple models because, you know, if one of the models went down, I mean, containers that contain the model, mm -hmm. then, uh, I mean, how does that look? How do you do the upgrades and things like that? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, great question. So um, we actually run everything in Kubernetes. Uh, including Elasticsearch was a little maybe uh, non-standard these days, but yeah, everything is in Kubernetes. We do uh, canary deployments and rolling updates of our models themselves, and so if they break, we can quickly roll back. And then we we use Datadog for monitoring our various metrics, latency, uh, QPS, those kinds of things, and we get alerted uh, sometimes late at night uh, when we're not meeting our metrics. So it gives us a good incentive to uh, not go too slow. Uh, yes, but does that answer your question? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, our main state is our feature store. So we we compute features about our listings, and we store them in, uh, like uh, Tio said, in last in memory store. We update it regularly. So in addition to caching them, we directly co compute them offline and write them to our store. And that is the only stateful part of our system. Thanks for the question. I think there was a question in the front. Two more. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing your experience of the, uh, you integrated your uh, machine learning uh, model with your uh, uh, searching system, right? And you mentioned uh, you use uh, Microsoft and you use Kubernetes, right? So uh, uh, would you please uh, share more details about how you use uh, uh, Kubernetes to uh, organize your uh, microservice? Thanks. So um, that's a good question and maybe a better question for our platform team. So I can only really give you at a high level um, how we use Kubernetes internally. Is there a specific, uh, I guess, question within that that you were thinking of, a specific topic? So my question is uh, probably you, you, uh, 
my question is, uh, you mentioned you use Kubernetes, right? Yes. To uh, uh, organize your uh, microservices. So uh, yes. I say, uh, would you please just share more details? How do you uh, use your uh, Kubernetes like, uh, to organize your uh, microservice mm -hmm. for a CSD or just uh, very quickly to, uh, uh, I mean, I mean very, quickly, very quickly to change your system to implementation your system and share more details about that? Sure. Um, I can try to give a kind of a high level. So at least from the ML productionization side of things, um, it's a very simple solution where we just you know create another set of Kubernetes manifests. We have kind of an automated templating system internally that will help us to do that. So in our case, as mentioned earlier, when AB testing these models, there's a lot of kind of manual setup of these manifests. And it, honestly, a lot of it was a copy and paste and just change a few fields here and there. And so I think that's the system we were trying to solve. So uh, short answer is, um, again, maybe, maybe not at the right level of abstraction, but we would just, for the ML models themselves to create different microservices, we have just a uh, set of manifests we use customize on top of that, and then we just run it for a new set of you know, manifests for that model. Thanks. Thanks. I'll add to it maybe a little bit. So like we said originally, the system wasn't designed for ML. And so it was a very kind of static system and endpoints don't change often. And so most of the endpoints were hard coded in various configuration files. So our entire Kubernetes uh, con configuration is a GitHub repo. And if you want to change the system, you make a PR. Uh, so if you want to add a microservice, it's a PR. And when we first started, it, it would be, we have to change almost every part of the system to manually code where the endpoints are. And then we would have, uh, if statements in our code to switch between which model to serve. So that wasn't, uh, it wasn't scalable. Uh, so what we did now was we're using Istio for routing. So we just put the feature flags into the headers and with Istio we just um, allow Selden to route the request to the right model and that allows us to serve a new model without changing any part of the system. The system just, the search server just calls the same endpoint every time and depending on what the feature flag headers are, Selden decides which model is going to serve that request. Interesting, yeah. Okay, follow on. Follow on question. Yeah, um, may I ask, um, how does this uh, search AI model in general uh, support pagination? So can you say that one more time? Pagination. Pagination. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So again, we worked with the existing search system. So whatever the pagination that was used within the search server is what we ranked, we ranked on top of. And so we can't get into too many details, but essentially we, we had to re-rank with that pagination in mind. Um, there was nothing special on top of that. Um, yeah, oh, short answer. But hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you very much for the sharing. Uh, I I just want to ask more regarding like the feature store. This is a bit interesting. Uh, so so uh, what you uh, can you just elaborate elaborate more on what how how are you guys using the feature store? Is it used for um, to save the results for um, like the feature extraction from item descriptions? And do you use that to, for model training mainly, or does it come in place? Like how does information how does data flow in this in this system? Yeah, in this sure. case. And I can get to it at a high level. So the short answer to those questions is yes. Right, for all of the things. Um, so primarily in the very beginning, there were some features of the model that again, they were being computed within the search workflow itself. And some of those were already kind of just there, right? Like say like, let's just pretend item name, right? We don't need to do any processing for that. It's just there. But there are other features, say maybe, you know, a clicks on an item, right? Let's just pretend that's one of the features in the feature store. And so those were the things that I realized, oh, like that isn't feasible to really calculate within a search request. And so you can easily look it up if we have just a feature store. So that's how it started. And then the yes to all the other um, questions that you had is we are evolving it to serve many more complicated features after that that um, have to do with both items and users. And then and I'll elaborate a little bit. Uh, so the first features that we get back is what we get back from Elasticsearch, things about the item. Uh, what's the description? How much does it cost? things like that, um, how many people have clicked like on it. And there, there are some things that we can't calculate just from the item itself, like um, what's the click-through rate that Tio mentioned, things like that, or personalization, like what does this user prefer, things like that. 
that we can't calculate just from Elasticsearch. So we pre-calculate it, and it's also the same things that we feed to our model, of course. And then at, uh, at query time, we look those up in the feature store and feed the, the things we get back from Elasticsearch together with the features that we computed, feed them into the model, and we get a re-ranking. Does that make sense? Okay, I think we're up for time, but thank you so much, Rick and Ryan. That we can tell. Thank you so much.